So another 10 shorts, these ones uh, specifically about philosophical topics covering a wide range, some on particular thinkers, some posing some challenges to me. So here you go. So I think it's kind of fitting that I start this one with a question about tens. So Mark Smith asked me, um, what are your 10 favorite philosophers and why do you enjoy them? So I was asked a question like this recently at a speaking gig that I did. And it was, it was put to me something like, uh, you're on the desert island, who, who are you going to take along? And um, this is more or less the list I came up with. So among the ancients, Plato, Aristotle, Epictetus, um, and then uh, medievals, for me, it's always going to be Anselm. Uh, I've got quite a few people in the modern and late modern era, so Hegel, uh, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche. Uh, but I also really like Descartes. And then there's two French Catholic thinkers from the 20th century who I particularly enjoy reading and thinking through, and that's Maurice Blondel and Gabriel Marcel. Um, now... Why do I enjoy them? It really depends on the particular philosopher. I enjoy different things about them. Um, Aristotle, you know, I enjoy seeing how all the, the parts sort of fit together as you read across the corpus, and, and I like his point of view on things. Uh, Epictetus, it's kind of similar, but we don't have quite as much stuff by him. Plato, I love, you know, the way he, he writes and the, the, the problems he poses, and, and I'm kind of a Platonist at heart in a lot of respects. Um, it's probably why I like Anselm and, and Maurice Blondel so much as well. Hegel is, is um, you know, with Hegel and Blondel, they're both these dialectical thinkers who try to encompass everything. They think that philosophy has a, a, a task to take in the totality and make sense out of, out of things. Um, and I really like that. I like the way that they, they did it. I, I agree with Blondell more than I do Hegel. Um, Kierkegaard and Marcel are kind of in the same boat with each other. They're non-systematic thinkers who are at the same time uh, pretty rigorous. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Nietzsche is Nietzsche, and same with Descartes. So here's a great question by James Paris. Do you consider economic writers as philosophers like uh, Keynes versus Hayek? And so the question is whether I consider them, you know, sufficiently reflective, sufficiently, I don't know what you would say, deep to be to be philosophers. Um, and I would say, yeah, a, a lot of a lot of economists. I mean, political economy used to be part of philosophy. Um, Adam Smith did not think of himself as an economist, but as a as a moral philosopher. And, you know, whether it's Keynes or Hayek or Galbraith, you know, really anybody who's doing that kind of high-level stuff, they're, they're going into philosophy. And they might be doing crappy philosophy, or they might be doing good philosophy. A lot of that depends on how, how well they actually understand their own activities. And I would say the same thing goes for sociology, you know, is... Um, is David Reisman and Thorsten Veblen, are they, are they philosophers? Max Weber, are they philosophers or are they sociologists? You know, um, Eric Mickels, people like that. Well, they're kind of both. It's okay to straddle different, um, different uh, boundaries that way. Um, a lot of philosophy is actually done outside of philosophy departments in part because of uh, what's happened to philosophy in the last hundred years, which really shrunk its, its purview in analytic, and I would even say in continental philosophy, uh, apart from its, its classical perspective. Um, so, you know, in, in poli-sci, in economics, and uh, psychology, and literature, history, there's a lot of people who, who are doing philosophy and, and not necessarily calling it philosophy. Um, on the other hand, in those disciplines, if you start asking philosophical questions, they may kick you out and suggest you go over to the philosophers. So, uh, this one comes from The Fates Have Warned, says, got another question. This one is on general metaphysics. 
Why do you think there's such an animosity towards teleology and philosophy since the modern era? I can only think of a few major philosophers since Descartes off the top of my head that are sympathetic to it. Um, so that's a complicated question. And here's a few scattered bits that, that maybe supply a bit of an answer. So first off, um, you know, teleological explanations were, were somewhat overdone by, by Scholastic and, and other thinkers who just weren't doing, some of them weren't doing a very good job at, at, uh, at philosophy and they were, they were using it to sort of fill in, in gaps and things and really less answer questions than just banish them. Um, and so there was like bad teologic, teleological thinking. And that's what the early moderns were really reacting against. Later on, people like Leibniz will say, you guys went too far. We need to bring back in some of these teleological notions and some of the other notions like substantial forms that, that you guys were too quick to throw away. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it comes in, it comes back in definitely with people like, like Hegel. Um, so I, I, you know, I would say that there is some, there's still some teleological thinking going on. But if you want your teleology to do any real work, you have to constantly rethink it. You have to figure out what actually can be given. Legitimate teleological explanations that can be often quite complicated, and what things are not susceptible, what things are better explained with with other modes of explanation. So you don't want to try to use it to cover everything. Um, maybe that answers the, the question. So Mark Smith has a good, good challenge here for me. Uh, you often talk about philosophers being top tier thinkers or not being so. What for you qualifies someone as a first rate philosopher, so to speak, or instead as a second rate thinker? Um, and I don't have a simple answer for that. You know, I'm, I'm tempted to say, well, you know, I just say so, uh, but that's, that's not really the case. Um, there's going to be some element of subjectivity to this, and because of the kind of work that I do, you know, as basically a historically informed philosopher, um, who takes seriously the notion that you, you really need to, like, work out what a philosopher is doing in general and then locate them in relation to, to other people's projects, a lot of people aren't going to share my views on this. Like I would consider, and this will probably be anathema for some people. I would say that that you know, uh, Bertrand Russell is a second-rate thinker. I would actually say that Roland Barthes is a second-rate thinker in continental philosophy. I would say that, um, you know, when we when we after you work in the field for a while, you kind of get a sense of who really has some some major contributions to make. And who's like a one-trick pony or who can't really take in, into account other people's views on things and has to treat them in very reductive ways, whose histories of philosophy are, are pretty much ideological crap, who is very schematic in, in what they do. Um, those are what make people second rate. Are you going to get a ton of mileage out of thinking the world, thinking the self, thinking the other, thinking about, you know, origins and God and, and all the, the great classic philosophical topics out of this thinker. That's part of what makes them first rate. But I would say another thing that's important for me, at least, is that they actually have some conception of what's going on in other people's work. So it's hard to be a really good thinker in isolation, in, in brilliant isolation, as we might say. Great question by Zero She Flies. What are your views on human perfectibility in the moral domain? Is there such a thing as real moral progress and how do we tell? This is probably not going to be a satisfying answer to many people. Um, human perfectibility. Do we mean perfectibility as in like reaching the end point through our own efforts? in a purely imminent process? If that's the case, then I say no. I think that we are radically damaged, and if you want to look at this in a Christian context, you can talk about original sin, which is not, by the way, you know, just some, some doctrine that, that covers over everything or, you know, a, a starting point for arguments, but rather it's, um, it's a problem. 
it, it's a call to actually like think things out. Like Marcel says, it, it's a mystery. Um, that said, is it possible to make moral progress? I think so. How do we tell when somebody's more, making moral progress? There's not one single criteria that we can appeal to. Um, and it's a lot easier at the lower levels, I think, to say, well, you're no longer killing your neighbor and screwing your neighbor's, you know, spouse and cheating everybody. You, you know, that's, that's some progress. Um, that's, that's a lot easier than, than getting into the, the harder, uh, stuff about where we really make progress, you know. Um, but I do think that moral progress is possible. I've seen it happen. Not as much in myself as I'd like to, to say. It's been more observing others. Um, but yeah, I think there is, there is real moral progress. Now, is there real moral progress as individuals or you know, as cultures or as societies? That's a, that's a larger and different question. And do we need some sort of connection to something transcending us to fill in the, all the gaps and holes and, and lacuna in ourselves I would say yes to that, but that's also a different question. So, Gerald Sword uh, mentioning, uh, I think, one of my first videos in the Half Hour Hegel series says, uh, you discuss the negation of the object. Is there any way to make sense of Sartre's ontological categories of being in itself and being for itself through the negation of the object, since consciousness relates to objects as subject and to itself as both subject and object? Um, well, yes and no. Um, for Sartre, you're not really negating the object uh, so much. The object is in itself, and it stays in itself whether you negate it or like it or don't like it. It's what it is. You know, this is a piece of paper and that's, that's it. Um, you yourself as a subject are a negation or a negativity, or, you know, a whole in being, or however you want to put it, um, who is able to engage in, in, you know, negation and nihilation. But that, that that's reflexive. That's being for itself. Um, and by the way, you know, whatever I happen to say about Hegel at one point in this series that's going to take me two years to complete, um, that's not all of Hegel. That's only a little bit of Hegel, and you got to you got to fuse it all together. Sartre is taking some some of his categories from from Hegel, um, but what Sartre is doing is is uh, in many respects more crude than than what Hegel's doing, and more uh, there's not a lot of you know growth or process going on in Sartre. The for itself, which is what you are. That means that you're pure negativity. Unless you decide to, you know, nail yourself down in some way, which never really works for Sartre, and objectify yourself as in itself, um, you don't really have determinacy. And Sartre also sees relations with the other as both of us trying to do that to each other. So another view asks a question which I've been asked in, in some of my earlier VU videos. Um, what do you think about race? Is there such a thing as, as a pure race? Or is race a myth? So is there such a thing as a pure race? No. I mean, if, if race is supposed to correspond to genetic pools of things, we know that there's tons of genetic variability and that a lot of the things that we call races aren't really races. All you really need to do to figure out that, that, that races, as we construct them sociologically, are rather arbitrary is go from country to country. And you'll find that people who, you know, in the United States, we have this, this one drop rule, you know, you're, you're considered African American or black or however you want to put it, if you have any uh, black ancestry. And go to Africa and see if they think that you're black. It's not going to happen because they, they parse out things differently. Um, then, you know, then go to Brazil and see that the gradations are, are very different. Go to Haiti and see that, you know, the, the degree actually matters. And we could do this for all sorts of other things too. There's no such thing as a white race. There's no such thing as a yellow race, a black race, a red race. They're all, you know, interfused and, and mixtures of things. And we do have, you know, some, some genetic, uh, pools, but they tend not to, to coincide so neatly with, with the traditional conceptions of race. 
Um, is it a myth? Yeah, it's a myth in the sense of, of being like stories that we tell ourselves. But, I mean, race does have effects within areas because people have treated each other differently because of racial differentiation. So if you want to say it's a myth, that doesn't mean that, like, we then say, oh, well, we're all, I'm colorblind, I can't see anything. Um, you got to acknowledge that, that race has, you know, had some, some pretty important effects. But it's not based in anything truly real. So here's a, a good follow-up to this, this question on race without even really realizing it. It's by Christopher Dunn. What are your thoughts on John Locke's idea of real essence? Um, i got to admit it's not something I, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, I don't do a lot of reading or writing on Locke, in, 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 at least in the last 10 years. I've got a few papers laying around that I, I wrote back a, a while ago and need to actually like send out, but I haven't done a lot of new work thinking in his categories. And when we talk about Locke's real essence, we need to distinguish it against Locke's notion of nominal essence. So the real essence would be what, you know, what really makes a thing what it is. So for physical things, like for example, the, this paper, um, you know, with these names on it, um, what makes the paper what it is, the substance, you know, and, and the, the qualities that it has and the way it's put together and all that. Um, what, what produces the effects on us, that's, that's its real essence. And um, then there's the nominal essence, and that's you know, our conception of what it is. And we get things right with physical things when the real essence corresponds to the nominal essence. Locke has a kind of weird idea that it's, it works the same way. He tries to transpose this into the realm of morality without, without a hell of a lot of success. His moral theory is kind of a mess. Um, it's really interesting stuff. Don't get me wrong. I, I love things that are that are philosophical messes, but it's it's um, it's hard to really um, make it make it adequately plausible to other people. Um, but it's it, it is based on this notion that there are real essences out there for for moral things, and then we can you know we we can come to have a conception of it that a, a nominal essence that actually corresponds to it. It makes maybe it makes a little bit more sense with mathematics, which is another thing that he thinks has has that same uh, thing. So I don't know if that helps you, but that's my idea about it. So Gerald Sword asks, what if any is the relation between Nietzsche's master-slave morality and Hegel's master-slave dynamic? Was Nietzsche trying to correct Hegel? I don't think so. Um, they're doing different things in their discussion of this. Um, Nietzsche is not talking about a master-slave morality. He talks about master morality, slave morality, and the gulf between them, and how radically different they are. And slave morality is a radical transvaluation of the of, of values. With Hegel, it's it's the the master slave or lordship and bondage. People get worked up. Oh, you should translate it this way, but it, it does translate to master and slave. Herrschaft and Knechthaft. Um, it's a dialectic. So the master gets to to exist for his own sake. The slave exists for the sake of the master, and it looks like the master has won because the master gets to enjoy. Reality through the mediation of the slave, but aha, the laugh is on him <clears throat> because the slave is the one who, who now develops and the master is just kind of dialectically done. So they're doing different things. I mean, is Nietzsche trying to correct Hegel on this? I don't even think they're in the same ballpark, really. Um, Hegel is going to go. Hegel for Hegel, this is going to be a tiny bit. People make a lot of hay out of the master-slave dialectic, but what's really important is what follows after it. Um, you know, the the shapes of unhappy consciousness, um, and then all the other things that are that are going on. So I, I don't see Nietzsche as sort of trying to correct Hegel on this. So last one by Gerald Sword. Um, 
One could argue from Hegel that the relation between master and slaves is justified, as it is the slaves who develop and grow in the end. This could justify cruelty and oppression, and he has examples like black slavery produced art forms like gospel, blues, or jazz music. Arguably self-reflective and self-conscious music, how can we escape from the justification for cruelty that seems to arise from Hegel? Hegel doesn't justify cruelty with the master-slave dialectic. That's not the point of it. It's to trace out um, sort of the beginnings of things, and it, it's not supposed to be like a justification for how society ought to be across the board. It's not even meant to be a suggestion about what's going on in, in all society at any given, given point in time. Uh, I think a lot of people read too much into the master-slave dialectic, in part because they're not reading the rest of the phenomenology or the rest of Hegel's works. Um, Hegel is not suggesting that um, you know there's a sort of theodicy to to the master-slave dialectic. Um, he fully understands that, like he says, you know, history is a slaughter bench. Uh, and, and lots and lots of, of, of terrible things have to happen along the way to, to people. Um, do good things come out of it? Yeah, I mean, it's not as if in the case that we're talking about here that the cruelty and oppression <clears throat> leads to the slaves producing these art forms for the masters. Because remember, in the master-slave dialectic, the slave is working on objects providing them to the master. Um, and, you know, is, is it really the case that, that gospel, blues, and jazz music are um, more self-reflective and self-conscious than other forms of, of music? I don't think so. Um, I think that, I don't, I don't even think that you can say that, that they're uniformly so. I think some, some composers probably a lot more, some perhaps less so. Um, in any case, I don't, I don't see Hegel as a sort of justifying cruelty and oppression uh, on, in that sort of way.